Welcome back to the channel. Today's the day we finish up our 2019 GMC Sierra Denali and get it back on the road so I can start hauling in more builds for you guys to watch. Let's get to it. So the first thing we're gonna to do today is change our ball joint. I'm gonna pull the tie rod end off, that out of the knuckle. Disconnect our ABS wires. Snap off all the clips. We'll leave the sensor on the knuckle. Disconnect our brake hose. We can unbolt our brake caliper. We're gonna take the bracket and everything with it and we'll just hang it up off to the side. Push the pads back in. And hang it up on our little bungee cord end that's already on the frame. I can unbolt the rotor, slide it off of there, and pull the cap off so we can see the drive axle. We'll just use a pry bar and an adjustable fulcrum, make sure we can pry it out of there. Pull the drive axle nut out. I can unbolt the upper ball joint, leave it on there a couple threads, and we'll knock it loose. Now we can pull the control arm down a little bit so we can unscrew the nut the rest of the way. Now we can unbolt the lower ball joint. Leave it on a couple threads. And it just fell right out of there. No hammering required. So we'll slide it off of there. That ball joint is more crooked than an Illinois politician. And just like the Illinois politicians, it needs to go in the pile. We'll use our favorite tool. There's a couple tabs that are bent over to keep it locked in there. Hammer them back in with our air chisel. And then we'll get our ball joint press. We'll press this out of here. Just to drive the tool experts nuts. Give it a little tap, tap, tap a -roo. Put our new ball joint in there. Make sure you got it facing in the right direction. And we'll get our actual ball joint press. Fun fact, I actually bought this ball joint press because the Snap-on guy said it was indestructible and warranted forever. I took that as a personal challenge and delivered him a broken ball joint press the next week. Since then I've only broken two more. So we'll press our ball joint in there. Pull up the caps off. And there's a couple notches. There's little arrows on the ball joint. So we have to bend those over, keep it in. And about the only way you get this wrong is if you don't have the grease fitting lined up with the indent that's in the lower control arm. So we'll hammer over our edges, keep our ball joint in there. And we'll put our grease fitting in. Or zerk fitting, whatever you call it. Click. I'm going to start putting everything back together. We had our drive axle bungee corded out of the way, so it didn't get in the way of our press when we were swinging it. Slide the drive axle into the knuckle. This thing is pretty heavy and awkward. Slide it up on the ball joint. There was no damage to the knuckle. On these, the ball joints are actually supposed to tear away, so that when they get in an accident, the wheel and everything comes off the vehicle and not into the vehicle, crushing people's legs and everything else. It actually did what it was designed to do. It just didn't get hit hard enough to tear the whole ball joint off, just stretch it out. Now we'll pull down on the upper control arm so we can get our ball joint nut started. Tighten it up. Put our drive axle nut on. Torque it down to manufacturer specs. Those are measured in ugga duggas. Put our rotor back on. Put our little retaining bolt back in. Because it actually is still usable. 
put our caliper back on there and bolt it in. Bolt our brake hose back on our knuckle and route our ABS wire all the way back up to the frame. We changed our inner tie rod end, but the outer tie rod end was almost as crooked as the ball joint, so we're going to have to change that now. It was enough that we could drive it around, but not enough that it's going to align properly. So we'll spin the old one off of there, spin our new one on, make sure you count the turns. Ah, I didn't even count. Good luck alignment guy. You're going to hate me on this one. Tighten it down. Use our adjustable hammer to tighten up the jam nut because I didn't feel like getting the right wrench. We'll pound our little cap on after we torque down our drive axle nut. Yeah, I actually did torque it down. Now we can pull the cap off the other side, pull our other drive axle out. Now we can unbolt the drive axle on the inside. Just I think eight bolts all the way around. Just spin it, get to each one. Work your way around. Once we're all out, just separate the axle. Pry it off of there. And it slides out. It's a little tight, but it does come out. And this is all you have to do. Clearly, this is one of those rare occasions where the engineer that was allowed to design this actually worked on vehicles and understood that it shouldn't be a struggle to do everything. That's why it actually makes sense on how they put this together. The hardest part about the whole job is not getting grease everywhere. I'll fail that part for sure. So we'll just slide our new axle into the knuckle and slide it up. Start our bolts, just work our way around, start each one, and we'll go around and tighten them all up. This one's a little bit different because it's an aftermarket axle, and that's why it doesn't have the indents, it's a circle. Still operates just the same. So now we'll tighten up all the bolts. And we'll put our drive axle nut on. Came with the new one, might as well use it. This is a temporary tire we threw on, a little bit small. So we got a little protein powder, a little creatine, and some pre-workout. Let's see if we can make it grow big and strong. Now we'll give it a couple minutes, check on it. Oh. That worked much faster than usual. Must have mixed it a little strong. I don't think our magic potion is going to fix that one. But I do have to break it down because I need the tire sensor that's inside. So this was our driver front wheel, in case you don't remember. That's why there's still a bit of tree or pole stuck in the rim. Looks like a telephone pole, which was a tree at one time. We'll break the bead loose. It does hold air, but I don't trust that little crack in there, so. Make sure you don't catch the valve. You want to lift it up where the valve is. That way the tire doesn't catch it when it goes around, because we don't want to break our sensor. And after all, that is the only reason we're taking this apart. So now we have our new wheel. Well, it's used. As a matter of fact, it came off the same truck that a lot of the parts for the Dirt Nolly came from. I probably should have bought that truck instead of the junkyard that bought it. So now we have our new tire. Make sure you start it so that it doesn't drop down on the sensor. Spin it around.
and our sensor survived. So now we can fill it up. I did get a set of brand new tires for this truck. The old tires actually went on the dirt nolly. Now it's time to install our carpeting. No, not inside the vehicle where you'd expect it. In the wheel wells. Where else? We'll start all the bolts. And then we'll run them in and tighten them up after they all started. There's quite a few. We want to make sure this carpeting doesn't fall out of there. We'll put our wheel opening molding on. Just clip in the little tabs and push it in. A little bit of wax that's dripping out of our door. And there's a couple bolts. Run those in there. And onto our carpeting on the other side. Same process. Make sure you don't tighten them all up first because they do like to push themselves out of alignment. So that's why I'm gonna leave them loose and just have them in there so you don't have to end up backing them out to move the carpeting around. 588-2300. You old Chicago people will know. Now onto the wheel opening molding. Snap it all in. And put our couple screws in. Now we can put our skid plates back on. After we cleaned all the dirt off of them. Rear one, just four bolts. I'll we'll put the front one up there. We'll pretend it's a skid plate. It's only plastic. The lower radiator hose clips in in the center. And it has four bolts that hold it up. I guess you'd call it a splash shield. Surprised I didn't make this one out of carpet. So in continuing with last week's random assembly, we're gonna randomly assemble this week. We're gonna change the cabin filter. I wait until we're all done. That way all the Bondo dust and everything else that I knocked down from the dash ends up on the old filter, not my new one. So you pull the lower glove box out. It's just four screws. There's a little cover and it slides right out. Some metal shavings, some leaves, all kinds of good stuff. So we'll put our new filter in. It's just the reverse. Slide it in there. Snap the cap on. Push our glove box up there. Clip it in. Open it up and run our four bolts in. Make sure it still works. And now we'll go back to changing our oil. No gloves. Oh no. Put our new oil filter on. Tighten it up. And we'll put our oil plug on and tighten it up. We'll get the one inch impact and make sure it's on there. Clean up our oil so that the clean freaks don't freak out. And we'll fill up our oil. Apparently the engineer that designed the oil fill cap is somebody that's never worked on a vehicle. Would it have killed you to make it a little easier to get to? I mean, it's not like changing oil is a service not performed very often. But nope, they hide it way back down there behind everything else. Now it's time to accept the fact that I have a rust proofing problem. So we're gonna rust proof our hood. It is brand new. Now's the best time. We'll make sure we get our cavity wax and all the seams all the way around. And when we're done with the hood, we'll do the fenders. Just get inside the opening, up over the wheel well, down in the back, the bottom, anywhere the dirt's gonna settle. 
because here in Illinois, that dirt is infused with salt. It sits there and just rots away from the inside. So spending a little time and a couple bucks now end up saving you a lot of time in the long run. Let me put our little hood gaskets on. They're just two-sided taped on. We'll line it all up, pull our two-sided tape off, stick it to our fender. Make sure it's on there. It's vitally important. Actually, it's not. If it wasn't in there, I don't think anything would happen. So now we'll put the passenger side on. This one's a little different. Clips in in the front. Has a tab that keeps it lined up in the center. And this one sticks to the bottom instead of the side. One was designed on a Tuesday. One was designed on a Thursday. Push it on there, make sure it's not going anywhere. And now we have to change our shock. So we'll pull the wiring harness up, clips onto the studs that are on the top of the shock, and we can loosen up our nuts. Take out the bolt that goes through the bottom. This was our used shock off our mistake truck. It's rusty and I don't like it. So I got a brand new set. They're takeoffs, so they have probably 10 miles on them, but they're not rusty. And that's what's important. I want to make sure I put fresh rust on them. So we'll start the nuts at the top. Run our bolt in at the bottom. Tighten down the bottom. And tighten down the top. After it's tightened down, we'll snap our wiring harness back on. Just pushes on. Hopefully it stays there. Or cavity wax. We're going to do over the wheel wells in the back and inside the bed, inside the bumper, and now we're going to do inside the rockers because, well, it's a GM. We'll pop all the little caps off. We'll run our cavity wax wand in there. We'll do it a couple times because there is a few panels in there. We want to make sure we're getting on both sides of each panel. Pop all our caps back on. And head over to the driver's side. I actually hate this part of the job. But if there's one thing I hate more than doing this, it's replacing rusty parts. So, it's worth it. So now we'll do inside our tailgate seam. If you're wondering why I use different wax, it depends on the application. Some works better than others for different places. The Transtar works good for the door seams because it's really runny. The Worth with the big gun is great for inside of rockers and wheel wells and stuff like that. And this 3M stuff is great for the little wand for getting in the seams where you can't get it to run down in there. I guess I could have pulled the plate off the inside of the tailgate and ran it down in there with the Transtar stuff, but that's extra work. 
So now we're just gonna wax the outside of the frame where the original wax was scraped away from the accident. This is just a regular spray gun style nozzle, just sprays it out. I used the black for this because that's what the factory used. So I'll coat everything that was messed up from the accident and a little bit more of the bottom of the truck, a little extra on the frame. I'll make sure I get a lot of it on the exhaust so that it burns off and smells like a melting crayon. So now we're back inside the vehicle where the carpeting belongs. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna cover it with plastic. How ironic. These are the GM floor liners. They snap together in the center. Now we can put our tray underneath the rear seat. We'll have two of the nuts out for our seat because the brackets for this tray bolt in there. So we'll line them up. Tighten them down. Then we can fold our seats down. Now you can put the front liner in on the passenger side. These actually fit fairly well. They're a little out of shape because they were sitting in the box. But a couple days in the sun, they'll lay flat again. And we'll put the driver's side liner in. The driver's side does have two little tabs it clicks in so that it doesn't bunch up underneath the pedals. Now it's time to put our door moldings on. We have our factory alignment system. We'll pull our two-sided tape off and we'll stick them on. Hopefully they're straight. Can't be any worse than the factory gets them. I know a lot of people don't like these moldings. I think the truck's a little plain without them, so we're gonna put them back on. Push it on there, make sure it's on there real good. I did mark where it goes. So they all start to look the same when they're in a pile. Pull the factory alignment system off, and we'll head over to the other side. We had our heat lamp on it. It was a little cold today. And the moldings are sitting on top, baking. Helps them stick a little bit better. And because they're plastic, it helps them form to the door a little better. Line it up, stick it on. Do the front door. Make sure it's warm enough. Not too warm. You don't want to blister the paint. And that heat lamp will do it. Don't ask me how I know. It also melts bumpers. So we'll line up the front, stick it on there. and peel off our factory alignment system and our labels. Now it's time for the nameplates so we know what kind of vehicle we drive. We'll pull off our template. This template spent most of its time stuck to the inside of the window. Turn it around and use it for the other side. People say the templates are different side to side. Well, the words are still spaced out the same. So you just have to get where the words end at the front or start at the front, depending on which side you are, in the right spot, and then your template works. So that's what I did. Now we can put our mud flaps on. I'm not a fan of mud flaps ordinarily, but these are actually useful. I'm going back and forth to my storage yard. I used to end up with all kinds of dirt on the running boards, but the mud flaps keeps that dirt to a minimum. So I'll put them back on even though this one's broken. Oh well, adds character and it doesn't bother me. 
I'll replace it next time. So we'll pull a little cap out of the inside of the bed. And we'll put our tie down hook in there. This truck I already had four. Now it's gonna have six. These things are really handy. They just snap in there and you screw them tight. Put our tightening tool in there. Click. Same thing on the other side. Snap it in, and tighten it up. Torque it down. Now we're gonna put our bed cover on. This is actually the bed cover that came off the dirt nolly because I actually really like it. It's a backflip. So there's two brackets, one on each side. A couple clamps that hold it in. So put the clamps on there and tighten them down. It's actually three clamps. This truck came with a bed cover. That's the one that went on the dirt nolly. I picked the one I liked for the truck I was going to keep. So now I'll put the cover down. Thing's actually pretty heavy. So there's two studs on the front. We'll slide those into the front of the brackets on the sides that we just put on. There is some adjustment on there, so we'll close it up, make sure it's aligned properly. Sometimes you have to move it forward or backwards. Let it go forward a little bit, make sure it fits. It does, so now we can tighten it down. There's actually just thumb screws on the bottom to tighten onto those studs, so we'll tighten those up. sure it works. We popped our caps out of the front and we just ran our drain tubes out there. Those brackets that we put on the side have little channels. The water collects in there and then runs out these drain tubes. Keeps the inside of the bed pretty dry. So we can fold it all back down. Now it's time to put our Duramax nameplates on the hood. I made a template. Actually, I bought a really expensive template. So we measured it off the dirt nolly. Because I didn't make one before. I got a little excited and ripped all the nameplates off before I made a template. I wasn't really worried since I did have one. Benefits of fixing the same truck over and over again. Polish up our nameplates. And that's it. Our truck is done. Now I'm going to let you guys in on a little secret. It's been done for quite a while. I now have 10,000 miles on it. But I learned my lesson with the Mustang. And can't let you guys know what's going on. Because people have no patience. So I did get the windows tinted in the front. And the sunroof gets a lot of use. I even used the tow hooks on the front. Because last winter, there were only three vehicles that would go through my storage yard. Both of them were white Sierra Denali's and one Lexus RX330. I actually had to winch out a six-wheel drive tow truck, and that's why I got to use my tow hooks. A lot of people said this was a lot of work. Well, the first day, I made it drivable. We put the suspension on it, and then I parked it. It sat for a while. I've actually had this truck for almost a year. I was busy doing other stuff. So I looked around for the best parts, prices, and it ended up that the dealer was the best for most of them. When it was time to work on it, I brought it in. And the first day, I changed all the front end parts that I had until I found out that that other fender was messed up. So that was about six hours. Painting them, painted up my parts, and I put it back together. Then next time I came in, I started tearing the roof off. That was one weekend. Friday night, I took it all apart. Saturday, I pulled the roof apart, put it back together. By Sunday, it was all primed and ready for paint. 
following weekend, the painting gnomes came in and painted our roof. Then I changed that fender, prepped everything, and they painted it. Then during the week, whenever I had free time after work, I came in and did little parts of the suspension and mechanical work. That's why I kind of jumped around a lot. So in total, I have less than 40 hours in this whole build. So you guys can tell me if it was worth it. I think so. So you want to know just how new this truck is? Well, it's so new that the plastic is still on the AC controls. I haven't even taken it off yet. For a new state record, I submitted the rebuild paperwork and had an inspection just 12 hours later. Since then, it's been to Texas three times. It's been to Boston, Indiana, Michigan. If you follow me on Instagram, you've actually seen it multiple times, starting with bringing home the silver terrain. That was the test drive, 2,500 miles, and it all started out in eight inches of snow. It's a hot one out there. Gotta stay hydrated. I like to keep my haters tears cool, my little water bottle here. If you like yours warm, I have coffee mugs available in my merch store, links in the description. Or if you just need a label for whatever container you're using, stickers are available as well. You know, whatever you store your haters tears in, your bucket, drum, tanker truck, guess it depends on how many haters you have. If you don't have any haters, start a YouTube channel. You'll have plenty. Well, it looks like our build is done, but there's only one way to be absolutely sure. It's time for everyone's favorite game. Let's find out what's in my console. Uh, we're going to have a problem here. That's some heavy gauge cold rolled plate steel. Has welded tabs and notched seams. Ain't getting in there with a hammer. Triple guard locking system. Ain't gonna be able to pry our way in here. Drill resistant locks. Drills out. Gonna take a little work to get into this guy. So our little problem here that's keeping us from finding out if this build is really done is console vault. It's the original in-vehicle safe, designed for people that want security, protection, and peace of mind. For storing their valuables, things that go bang, or if you're like me, the extra nuts and bolts from your build that you don't want anyone to find. It's actually perfect for people like me. I'm on the road a lot, I'm not always with my truck, and I don't like stuff that's valuable just sitting in my console or in the glove box. So, if I can't take it with me, at least now I can lock it up in here and feel a little safer. There's three different lock combinations available. There's a keyed lock, there's a three digit code, and then there's a four digit code like this one. It's available for a bunch of different vehicles and seating configurations. It installs in 10 to 15 minutes and right inside the factory console. I think they're being pretty generous with that 15 minutes. Probably more realistic like five because there's no cutting, no drilling, nothing required. Everything you need to install it comes with. Just drop it in, bolt it down, and you're ready to go. There's a perfectly balanced spring assist door so when it's open, it's not constantly slamming down on you. So while I work on getting into my console vault, why don't you go pick up your own? Links in the description. Use code VCOR at checkout to save yourself at least 10%. Well, since I never found out what was in my console, I guess this build isn't done. I guess I have to keep the truck. Shucks. I'm really heartbroken about that. So until next time, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon. Zero 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 one zero 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 two zero 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 three zero 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 four zero 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 five zero 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 six zero 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 seven